Hey, everybody. It's Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I want to welcome you this morning to our midweek video, our Thursday morning video. It's good to be with you. Last week, I wasn't feeling very well, lost my voice for the majority of the week, and so I didn't make a video. So it's good to be getting back into this this morning. It is early Thursday morning, and I wanted to make sure that I got one of these done this week. I want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell so that you can stay current with the ministry, the content we make here uh, from my office uh, midweek, as well as when we go live from the assembly building on Sunday mornings, which we do at 9 a.m. with Adult Sunday School and then again at 1040 with our main Sunday morning service. Featured book for the month of uh, February now. It is February. I'm glad that it's February personally, but our featured book for the month of February is my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. This book is about the career and life of Bollinger with a specific focus on uh, discerning when Bollinger fully embraced and adopted the Acts 28 dispensational position and a pretty in-depth look into how all of that happened as well as Bollinger's notion of the postscript theory on Romans 16.25. So if you're into the history of dispensationalism, if you want to know more about this important figure in the history of dispensationalism, I would encourage you to check out this book. There'll be a link to this in the description where you can order direct from the publisher, Dispensational Publishing House. So please consider supporting the ministry by picking up a copy of Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger. Also want to remind you here about our Rumble channel. We established this channel in uh, 2021 as an alt tech site to YouTube. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, and we are currently up to 177 subscribers. So it's slowly growing here, which we're excited about. But if you haven't already done uh, so, and if you're into alt tech sites, please consider subscribing here to our Rumble channel. Now, two weeks ago, before I got sick, we were um, in the middle of this study here on pilfering the paper pope i did this this study two weeks ago on pilfering the paper pope assessing the origin of the originals only position and this was a sub uh study of a larger study that i had done for our bible conference at grace life bible church in 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the reformation that larger study is called uh Pilfering the Paper Pope of Protestantism, Understanding Why the Reformation Fizzled. And I'll have a link again to that video as well in the description for this one. But the one I did two weeks ago was just a breakdown of where the originals only position came from. And we saw that it originated in the writings of the Roman Catholic monk slash priest Richard Simon, where he was attacking the Protestant principle of Sola Scriptura by saying that there were errors in the extant copies of the, of the Bible. And so um, the first originals were lost, and the only way to have any uh, assurity or anything in matters of doctrine, etc., is to add the tradition of the Catholic Church to that. And so we talked about in that video, uh, well, uh, two weeks ago, excuse me. In this video, I want to go a little step further. I want to talk about some things about Westcott and Hort. And, you know, the reality is a lot of times when you read about Westcott and Hort in uh, pro King James literature, it's it's very it tends to be very sensational. It tends to focus on, you know, um, them being involved in occultic activities and so on and so forth. And I have looked into that somewhat. And that's not the point of this video. But just as an aside, uh, what I've gathered from looking into that is that Anything about the ghostly guild and any of that stuff was stuff that they were into or were toying with when they were like 19, late night, late teens, early 20s. And I'm not excusing them at all for doing that. But like to me, those aren't strong arguments for why we should, um, you know, not adopt their views on textual criticism in the New Testament text. What's far more important to me is what did they actually say about the text? than it is what they were doing when they were, you know, in their late teens, early 20s. I'm sure all of us could, if we were honest, would say we may have been into some things we're not so proud of when we were at that age. So that, that I want to focus here on what did they say about the text, not what were they doing when they were of that age, okay? So that's what we're going to primarily focus on here on this video. 
So this is a sort of a part two then of what we did two weeks ago. I want to pick this up, though, by talking about the view of the reformers about inerrancy and infallibility. In the last video, I talked to you about the Lutheran dogmaticians. We looked at Francis Turretin as two examples of, you know, what the attitude was of the of the um, reformers towards the text that they had. And we saw that they viewed the apographia, the copies, as just as authoritative as the as the original and we saw that everything they were saying about inerrancy etc was or infallibility was related to those copies that they had in their possession and more to put a finer point on it the printed editions of the greek new testament that were available to them okay now they also had things to say about uh inerrancy and infallibility and this is from the westminster confession this is chapter one article five and notice what it says it says we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the scripture and the heaviness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine and the majesty of the style and the consent of all parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God and the full discovery it makes of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> still getting over that just a little bit. Sorry about that. The full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation and the many other incomparable excellencies. Now watch. And the entire protection thereof are arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. So <clears throat> the reformers believed in the drafters of the Westminster Confession of Faith, arguably the most famous Protestant confessional statement um, ever drafted, believed in the infallibility of the scripture. And they believed that it had divine authority and they believed that it was infallible. And that's their language there. Okay. So my investigation to the writings of Luther and Calvin then revealed that these men believed the scriptures were inerrant simply because they were the word of God. The belief that the scriptures were infallible was based upon the inward working of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts, according to the Westminster Confession. There was no formal theological doctrine of inerrancy, and it was certainly not limited to the original autographs only. So the, 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 the reformers, Luther, Calvin, the drafters of the, Declar of the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, they believed in the infallibility of scripture because of, of what the scriptures were, what the scriptures claimed to be, what the witness of the Holy Spirit was through the word to them is what they say here in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And we can see what they said here about Sola Scriptura, also from chapter 1, article 9 of the Westminster Confession. They call the scriptures the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is scripture itself. So not only are the scriptures infallible, but the scriptures are sufficient in and of themselves as the only rule and the only thing necessary to interpret scripture, okay? Now, Richard Simon, as we saw in the last video, attacks all of this. So when we think about the issue of textual criticism from the point of view of the Protestant reformers, there are some presuppositions that we need to keep in mind, right? Number one, the scriptures were inspired, were the inspired word of God and of divine origin. This is what they maintained. What God gave by inspiration was preserved and, quote, kept pure in all ages. We saw that in the video from two weeks ago. We saw they said that God's word was available and translated into the vernacular languages of the nations. And we also saw in the last video that it was therefore still the word of God, even though it had been translated into other vernacular languages. And then finally, when it was translated, it remained the word of God and retained its divine authority. So. There's no doubt that the Protestant reformers, Stephanus, Beza, particularly guys who were interested in the uh, in the printed text, the Textus Receptus, the Greek text, supporting the Reformation Bible, Arab Bibles, they didn't. They were involved in in a certain level of textual criticism. There's no doubt about that. In that they're noting variant readings, uh, Stephanus and Beza particularly, and so they're 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 aware of the fact there are some variant readings, etc. 
but they're not letting the, that reality undermine their belief in, in, the, in the core tenets of what the Reformation stood for in contradistinction to Roman Catholics. Now, as we move through the 17, the 1600s, the 1700s into the 1800s, there start to be Roman Catholic counter-Reformation attacks on the Protestant view of Scripture, like we saw last in the last video when we looked at Richard Simon. Now, all of that is going to come to a head, and I personally believe that a lot of that is because of variant readings. So Richard Simon's whole reason for saying that the Protestant view of Sola Scriptura was insufficient is because the first originals were lost, and because there are what he called errors in the copies or variant readings in the copies. Now, I believe that this whole thing becomes sort of Mount Impassable, if you will, in this discussion. And it's all going to come to a head in the 19th century when instead of holding the line in the face of attack, Protestant theologians revised Protestant bibliology according to the terms, according to terms set by their opponents uh, in an attempt to address the existence of variant readings Three, the three doctrines noted above were altered in the following ways, okay? So inspiration was limited to the non-existent original autographs. Divine dictation was dropped and ridiculed as a descriptor for how inspiration was accomplished. Preservation, the promise of preservation was dropped from doctrinal statements. And inerrancy, a formal doctrine was developed that limited inerrancy to the non-existent original autographs that took shape around or in the form of a logical syllogism that met the German higher critics on their own terms instead of just holding the line in what the Protestants had already staked out prior to this, okay? So these revised points then became the new Protestant orthodoxy on the Bible that became carried forward then into the 20th century by fundamentalists in their doctrinal statements, okay? So these changes, among others, caused textual criticism to be reworked, starting with the rationalistic or naturalistic notion that the Bible is like any other book and should be treated in the same manner as any other book of antiquity. Okay, So the net effect then of these phenomenon was that the traditional Greek text of the Reformation, the Textus Receptus, was replaced by a so-called new and improved Greek text based upon the rationalistic suppositions of Westcott and Hort. So the four views that are driving all of this, the four challenges, I've noted them here, were evolution, liberalism slash modernism, German higher criticism, and uh, enlightenment rationalism. Those are the things that were driving this shift. And so the text is going to be questioned on the basis of this, and, it, and many of these core Protestant doctrines now are going to be redefined. Okay. So what we want to do now is we want to look at some things about Westcott and Hort about what they believed about the text. That, to me, is what I'm most concerned with. What did they say and what did they believe about the text? So the first thing that we're going to do to do this is we're going to jump into the life and letters of Hort. Okay, if I can get it to load. We're going to look at the life and letters of Hort. And we're going to start here. i got to change this page number. We want to start with a letter that he wrote to the Reverend John Ellerton in 1851 okay we want to look at a letter that he wrote to john ellerton in 1851 where he is talking about issues related here to uh to the text so let's find the beginning of this quote here and look at what he says so he's talking about how he's doing research into uh text criticism and into the into the gospels and he talks about how he's looking at um, different lines of evidence. And we'll start at this paragraph right here. He says, I'm doing some uh, light, steady work. Every night after prayers, I log down a big pile of books. And then he tells you what he's looking at. Uh, Brugger's Concordance, uh, Olashem, DeWitt, Tischendorf's text, uh, Baxter's critical Let's uh, get the page to cooperate. Greek uh, Testament and a German dictionary and the work of Saint uh, and work at Saint Paul's chronology. I have been two nights in Second Thessalonians chapter two and have a and have at last got some light. Okay, so he's talking about his study here. He's talking about what he's doing uh, in his study, 
Then we get this sentence. I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of text, having read so little Greek Testament and dragged, now watch, and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus, Westcott recommended to me Baxter's Critical, which has Schultz's text and is more convenient in small quattro with parallel Greek and English in a wide margin uh, for notes. So notice what he, Hort, is calling the text of the Reformation. He's calling it the villainous Textus Receptus. So this is the very text that the Lutheran dogmaticians, that Turretin, were calling infallible, they were calling it, uh, they, they, were, they were assigning all of the descriptors of the Westminster Confession to the very text here that Hort, in his letter of uh, 1851, is calling villainous. We could look at a second letter from Hort, from 1853. We could look at a second letter from Hort from 1853, uh, where he is also going to be discussing some things here. And let me find the letter. Here it is. It's also to Ellerton. And we will see what he says. Notice, there's a bunch of stuff here that we're going to skip just for the sake of time. He says, one result of our talk, I may as well tell you, he and I, I believe he's talking about Westcott here, are going to edit a Greek text of the New Testament some two or three years hence. So he says this in 1853. Okay, it'd be way longer than that. Lachman and Tichendorf will supply rich materials, but not nearly enough. And we hope to do a good deal with the uh, Oriental versions. Now watch. Our object is to supply clergymen, generally, schools, etc., with a portable Greek text, which shall not be disfigured with Byzantine corruptions. So... Here he is saying in a letter from 1851, the first one we looked at, that the Texas Receptus is villainous and vile. Here we see him, here we hear the here we see him talking about Byzantine corruptions and what his goal is to replace that text with a new text, and that he and uh, Westcott are going to be working on that. So we can see here very plainly what his attitude was towards the text of the Reformation. Now, this is not me making it up. This is not me reporting stuff that wasn't said. We are actually looking at Hort's letters from volume one of his published, The Life and Letters of, of John Fenton Anthony Hort. All right. Now, we can look at another thing here that is very telling. If we go to page uh, PDF page 420 of this document, we can see what he said in a letter to Lightfoot. Now, this one is a little bit longer. And I want to show you the letter, and then I'm going to probably read it from my notes, just because it's easier to follow. But this is a lighter, uh, a lighter, sorry. This is a letter to Lightfoot, where he is talking about some other things. And this letter is from 1860. Now, where I believe I start the quote is in this section here, which would be on page 420 from the book, where we could see he starts talking here about, I'm convinced that any of you of the Gospels, which distinctly and consistently uh, recognizes for them a natural and historical origin, whether under a special divine superintendence or not, and assumes that they did not drop down from heaven, ready uh, drop down from heaven ready made, must and will be startling to an, to an immense portion of educated English people. But so far, at least, Westcott and I. Westcott and I are perfectly agreed, and I confess I had hoped that you would too would assent, and if the and if thus much be conceded, I cannot see that my supposed view is a whit more startling than Westcott's. But I now feel I must say a word about the general principles. Now that here's him talking to Lightfoot. If you make a decided conviction of the absolute infallibility of the New Testament, particular, uh, particularly, practically, excuse me, a sine qua non for cooperation, I fear I cannot join you, even if you were willing to forget your fears about the origin of the gospel, I must 
I must anxious to find the New Testament infallible and have a strong sense of divine purpose guiding all of its parts, but I cannot see how the exact limits of such guidance can be can be ascertained except by unbiased a posteriori criticism. What is he saying? He's saying that if Lifefoot is going to make belief in the infallibility of the New Testament, a sine qua non, or without which it cannot be, um, tenant of cooperation between them, he's not going to be able to work with Lightfoot. And he's going to, and he says that he cannot see the idea of that New Testament being infallible except by unbi- an unbiased and posteriori criticism. In other words, he does not view it to be infallible in the same way that the reformers believed it to be infallible. Now, again, that's not me making it up. That's Westcott himself. And we could come back into this letter here. So here we saw this part, the stuff in bold. He says he's anxious, unbiased, posterior. And then he ends the letter. Most strongly, I I recognize it, but I am not prepared to say that that it necessarily involves absolute infallibility. Hort did not believe in the absolute infallibility of the New Testament. He says so in his own letters. These things to me are much more important when we evaluate their attitude toward the text. They viewed, Hort viewed, the text of the Protestant Reformation to be villainous. He called it that. He called it disfigured by Byzantine corruptions. He does not believe that it is infallible uh, the way that the Protestant reformers did. And then this lower view of Scripture then is going to be the view out of which the Greek New Testament is going to be re-edited. Now, we also want to look at the Greek New Testament itself. So here we have their Greek New Testament pulled up on the screen, and we need to see that they say that the New Testament is should be treated based upon the same principles of any ancient text. So there's nothing unique and distinct about it. Here they are in part two, what page is this? Page 73 of their front material in the Greek New Testament. Notice, the principles of criticism explained in the forward in the foregoing section hold good for all ancient texts preserved in a plurality of documents. In dealing with the text of the New Testament, no new principle, whatever is needed or legitimate, but no other ancient text admits so full and extensive application of all the various means of discriminating original from erroneous readings in which have been suggested uh, to scholars the study of the, condi- of the conditions of textual transmission. So what Hort is saying, what Westcott and Hort are saying here in the front material is essentially that the scriptures are like any other book of antiquity, that they do not and should not be treated in any other way that is different or distinct from the way you would treat any other book, uh, any other ancient book from antiquity that existed in a plurality of documents. So there's nothing unique and distinct about the scriptures that should set them apart. They should be treated in the same naturalistic, rationalistic way that we would treat, say, Homer or Aristotle or Plato or any other books from antiquity. We could go further into this and look at some more things that they say about this. And we go now to, uh, let me make sure my page is right here. And I'm going to have to go back to the notes and identify exactly what I wanted to read here. Here we are. Um, talk. They, they are talking in the context about corruption to the text. And they make out like it corruption could have even come from the hands of the original writer themselves okay little is gained by speculating as to the precise point in which such such corruptions are made now watch they may be due to the original writer or to his amanuensis if he wrote from dictation or they may be due to one of the earliest transcribers. <clears throat> so Westcott and Hort are saying that textual corruption could have come from the hand of the original writers or from the amanuensis writing from dictation by the original writers. So they never were infallible. 
is what seems to be the case. Okay. So if we come back over here and we read what I have in my notes, Drs. Westcott and Horton were the chief architects of the critical methodology and authors of the new and improved Greek text. They began their work with the presupposition that, that the Bible is like any other book and should be treated using the same rules of textual criticism as the writings of Plato, Aristotle, or any other work of antiquity. Moreover, they infer that textual corruption could have entered the text via the hands of the original authors or their amanuensis. We just read it. At this point, Hort stands in opposition to the modern evangelical scholarship and that he allows for corruption to have entered the text via the original writer. Such a position places such a position explains why Hort is reluctant to ascribe uh, uh, infallibility to the uh, to the text in any form, like we saw here in the letter in the letter from Lightfoot. Okay, now I'm going to wrap this up, and then we'll look at some more stuff in next week. This is the type of textual criticism that Dr. Edward F. Hills is referring to when he talks about the quote naturalistic method in the King James Version defined. He is speaking about an approach to Scripture that doubts their supernatural origin doubts their infallibility even in the original autographs and treats the bible as though it were any other book such was the approach of doctors westcott and hort in the english-speaking world the net effect of this process was the publication of the revised version in 1881 this version was based upon the rationalistic greek text of westcott and hort so we cannot underestimate the seismic shift that took place in Protestant understanding of the scriptures in the 19th century as a result of all of this. So this is, things are dropped into the thought stream by Simon in the 1600s. They percolate through the 1700s into the 1800s. And before you know it here, those who are, who are supposed to be defending the Protestant understanding of scripture in the face of criticism now, not only from Catholics in the 19th century, but from evolution, from modernists, from German higher criticism, from Enlightenment rationalism, are now going to redefine, fundamentally redefine what the Bible is in ways that the Protestant reformers themselves never would have been okay with in an attempt to meet the four challenges of evolution, Enlightenment rationalism, German higher criticism, and modernism on terms set by their opponents. The net effect of all of this is a seismic shift and a reshaping of Protestant bibliology. Now, next week, we'll talk about this point, about why the Reformation fizzled and what the net effect is of all of this. So before you go, I want to remind you about our Rumble channel. I want to remind you here about our a few things. First of all, if you haven't done so, if you like this video, Please like this video, share it, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel. Don't forget our featured book for the month of February, uh, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger. Don't forget our Rumble channel. Also, our study here, our rebroadcasting of the Grace History Project here on this YouTube channel. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 o'clock is well underway. And we've established a playlist here. By the end of this week, this list will be populated with 41 lessons. Please check them out in the description for all these lessons. You'll find links to the audio, the PDF notes, the PowerPoint presentation that I use to teach those if you're interested. Also want to remind you about our, our class, ongoing class for the adult Sunday school hour at Grace Life Bible Church. From this generation forever, a study of God's promise to preserve his word. Man, we're, we're, we're getting really thick and deep right now into a study of the King James Bible and the primary source, the work in progress documents and what they tell us and can teach us about what kind of process and what the decisions that were actually made by the King James translators. I'm really excited to finally be getting into all of that. Also want to remind you about my podcast with my wife. Uh, we have a new episode last week, Fireside Chat, Advice and Do's and Don'ts of Being in the Ministry. We're trying to make an episode every week for this podcast, so please check that out. And then last, I want to remind you about Grace Life Bible Church. We go live from the church building every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and around 1040. And you can now catch us live right on the church's webpage through BoxCast. 
and you can see you can uh, join us live. So we are now live three places on Sunday morning, YouTube, Facebook, and right here on the church's webpage, gracelifebiblechurch.com. Glad you joined this video. Before you go, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you have never relied exclusively on his death, his shed blood, his death, burial, and resurrection on the, upon the cross as the only total complete payment for your sin, please don't let another day go by before trusting the simplicity of the gospel. God loves you. Christ died for your sins. He rose again the third day. He was delivered for your offenses, and he was raised again for your justification. If you will believe and trust the simplicity of that message, you can pass from death to life. He'll give you eternal life as a free gift. You'll be taken out from underneath the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Won't you trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late? Thanks for your time, and we'll see you next week.